This is the Transcend in Life podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson, taking you from fear to freedom. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Transcend in Life podcast. We have a very special guest, someone that if you could see her smile right now, she literally lights up a room when she walks through the door. But she is also extremely intelligent. Dr. Lena Bakshi intensively studies STEM education and how we can create access and opportunities for each and every student, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or socioeconomic status. She founded STEM for Real, a nonprofit professional le- learning organization committed to combining STEM content, learning with principles of equity and social injustice or social justice. Excuse me, Lena, you truly are a unique individual. I know there's so much to what you've done. I my, being I come from a, a, my mother was a teacher for 39 years. I so believe in what you and your team are doing. Welcome to the team. I cannot wait to have this conversation. How are you? I am great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here and to uh, to have this great conversation. So you did start with education and you have d- degrees literally in your intro. I could have gone on for half a page about the degrees that you've obtained, but it's always been focused around really education and making sure that people are getting, I guess my naive understanding would be just equal opportunity when it comes to education. That may be simplistic, but can you kind of give us a a background and, and how you got to where you're sitting today? Because it's, I love being around you. I love what you're doing. And I just want the audience to hear what that's all about. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think for me, uh, the world of education, I really fell into the industry uh, before I was always into math and science. And, you know, my plan and my trajectory was to become a doctor. And um, and so when I was in undergrad, I, I entered undergrad with this, you know, oh, I had straight A's in high school. I'm so smart. And then I just found myself completely, you know, failing chemistry, failing calculus, failing everything. Like it just was one after the other. And, and that sort of, you know, that, that idea of just being, of seeing failure right in front of me, I was like, I I really had to, um, I had to sit with that. And um, and so I, I joke saying I think I'm the only major uh, biology major at UC Berkeley to have failed introductory biology because like, you know, the, the pressure and the intensity was was really tough. So I think, um, you know, at the end, of course, happy ending, I was able to graduate and overcome and all of that. And so when I was um, when I had. I was uh, studying for the MCATs, I was like, you know, I'd love to, you know, go back to my middle school or high school and see if I can teach while, uh, while I go through the admissions process. And I just fell in love. It was, um, it was such an interesting experience to see that when I was in school, I was in my own little bubble of students that we all just sort of studied together and, and whatnot. But then as a teacher, you're not just teaching the students that, you know, um, get straight A's, like you're teaching everyone. And that was sort of eye opening for me was to see that there's a whole entire system that that systematically really, you know, uh, serves one group of students and not another. And it just so happened that I happened to be in the group that that was served. However, I also reflected on, wow, who in my class was it? And that was sort of my big aha where I was like, wow, what can I do about this? So talk more about that because, again, I did an intro, but I want people to really understand what you saw because to take an idea and bring it to fruition, so much of the good work that you're doing, clearly you're passionate about it. And we'll get back to you failing in school because it's hard for me to imagine. And I'm sure you did it smiling all the way through, just like you always do. But talk to me about who was that group that wasn't and maybe still isn't being served. I don't know, because I think that's what you guys are passionate about. It's what STEM for Real is all about and what you guys are really trying to tackle. 
who is that population and how can we support what you're doing? Yeah, you know, I thought I think of, you know, my very one of my very first students, her name was Bridget. And it just so happened that her teacher said, you know, you're really advanced for this course, you need to be in um, Miss Bakshi's honors course. And so that moment came and she's Nigerian American and she um, so she was so she was transferred to my course. And of course, she was, you know, acing my class, a very, very bright young girl. And then as soon as she got into high school, um, I, I a lot of her a lot of her teachers had I don't know if they had labeled her as not a math person, but something happened from where she was the at the top of my algebra course in eighth grade to I don't want ever want to see math again. And then when she got into college, she ended up, you know, I mean, she she's living a great life now and, and majored well and everything. However, um, somewhere in between, we lost a potential student that could be studying math or studying science and or and even if they're not studying math or science they were so afraid of taking a course and really developing themselves there because they lost their confidence and it just so happens that that same story happens to many of our black and brown populations that experience this sort of um, this implicit bias and the systemic racism that is in place and and again, it, it really just you you get to thinking, OK, one time. All right. Happenstance. The second time. Mm, OK, that's a coincidence. But then when you start looking at the the overarching statistics of how we are really losing our our pipeline from school to STEM, we're really losing our diversity. You have to I, I have to ask myself, well, what is it? What's going on? And um, so that was one case. And then another case is where I had a student that had immigrated from Mexico and again, top of my class. However, you know, because he didn't speak English, he was automatically placed in the English learner track. And and so again, there I was able to see like, oh no, this kid, he's got it. Like we need to make sure that we foster that that love for mathematics. He's got it. And um However, after that, after you lose that connection with the student, the system takes over and who knows what where he is. I'm hoping that he was able to still be that same lover of mathematics. But unfortunately, that is not the case for many of our students. That's interesting. Is it do you feel like it's because they're overwhelmed or is it again, you, you mentioned got labeled and you've I've read it in other books where it's quite literally this identity is put on somebody like oh you're good at math or you're not and the whole Carol Dweck talks talks about growth mindset versus fixed mindset and I think mm -hmm. that's part of what it, it sounds like you're saying is look I see real potential or not even potential you have all that you need if you just stick with it and and you, you actually maybe you have an affinity towards a science or mathematics and I want to explore that. So how do you feel that that comes about? Because again, a lot of folks listening to this are parents. They do have kiddos that maybe fit in these boxes that we're talking about. So how can they as parents su support making sure that they don't lose that love for science or, or, or math and, and getting in, into another box, I guess, is, is what it really sounds like. You know, and I'm glad you brought that up because it, it really does come from our parents to advocate, especially at the elementary levels and at the, at the you know, in that, in that age group, K through five, pre-K all the way to fifth grade. Uh, a lot of emphasis is on mathematics and English language and arts instruction because that's where the testing is. And so science is very much oftentimes not taught or not addressed on a regular basis because mo so much of the accountability measures are on math and ELA. And so we are finding that if you don't fit in this box, again, you get that label. So I remember when with my own, with my mom, she was like, I need to make sure that you're labeled as, as gate, as gifted and talented, because she learned that 
there is an advantage when you get that label. On the other hand, there is a disadvantage. I had a cousin that said a Hindi word in in the mix of all her English words, and she was immediately put into the English and language or the English learner track. And unfortunately, we have this. We we thought Brown versus Board was gone with separate but equal. Um, unfortunately, these are the inner the sort of implicit ways that it still exists. It's separate and it's very unequal. There's a lack of rigor that we're finding. We think we're providing resources when really it's just a lot of separation and isolation that we're seeing. And so with parents, uh, well, one, I would emphasize that we just foster that curiosity. I mean, science is all around us. And you don't not I'm not saying that every single student has to grow up to become a scientist, but I think that we live in such a a world that needs to be informed by science, especially as we are, you know, citizens and like that citizen science and that civic sort of education of understanding how we vote, uh, looking at climate change, looking at um, the pandemic and how yes, okay, wear a mask, it stops uh, It stops the spread. But it turns into this like political discussion. And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's just science. It's just a study, like, you know, having that sort of sense. That's the first thing I would add. And then the second one, I get I hear this label a lot. I'm not a math person. And it's funny, because, you know, I don't, I don't think you can say that as often, like, oh, I just can't read. You know, but then when you can easily get away with saying, I'm just not a math person. And this is how you become a math person. You do math and you're a person. That's it. That's it. And that's where we as parents have to really emphasize this sort of idea that anyone can do anything and we should really dismantle those labels. Well, you're hearing it from somebody that apparently failed biology and then became a literally had her doctorate in it. So, so it's you don't want to label yourself. Okay, so you I mean, you mentioned the pandemic, and that is interesting. Not that we need to go down that rabbit hole a ton, but this is a lot of science, and yet the science isn't necessarily being talked about, and some of it's over sensationalized to fit whatever agenda. How are you seeing schools really being affected by this virtual learning? How are you guys adjusting? Because I know you, your your company has made some real, uh, you know, pivots in how you do some of your. So what what do you see going on with your your company specifically, and also the schools? Because I know nobody has a, a crystal ball, and nobody knows what it's going to look like three months from now, six months, even a year. But you are seeing some of the things happen. So what are you guys doing to adjust to the pandemic? You know, for us, we really had to. I mean, we had so many, um, you know, uh, professional learning events and everything lined up and all of that just came to a halt. And so a lot of the visioning work that you talked about was, was really pivotal in in maintaining our morale and our team and our spirit, really, to just keep on keeping on. And so we pivoted. We're like, okay, well, if we do this alive, then we can do it virtually. And so we transferred all of our um, professional learning events and everything into the digital world. And um, and then we just started uh, just we we took a moment to stop and listen to our teachers and to really think about what do they need? What do they, as as a whole entire industry has just gotten, you know, this, this total upheaval, how are they going to now teach to everyone? And already there's so much inequity in the educational systems. And now this, this the whole digital divide further like stratifies the equity that we that we don't really see. So we're seeing a, a lack of Wi-Fi, a lack, a lack of access, a lack of, you know, uh, technology and materials. And it's not necessarily a conversation of rich versus poor. It could even be your, you know, the average household. I mean, right now I'm sequestered in the in one room and, uh, you know, my partner is in the other room and we're trying to navigate when to use what and how to use the technology. So that's something that has come up that we really had to had to adapt and make sure that we were meeting the needs of our teachers, but also 
emphasizing that equity is not on a pandemic either. It's not taking a break. Uh, we have two pandemics going on right now. We have the one with the coronavirus, and we also are seeing the entire world wake up after the events of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and just seeing this, this social upheaval as well as we deal with the systemic racism. So it's nice to, I mean, of course it's horrible, but in a sense, it's also this sort of liberating idea where we're seeing people wake up and sort of see a need for the work that we at STEM for Real are doing. Yeah, there's no question there's a huge need. And I, not, I don't mean to make this about my mom and can keep coming back to, but she worked at what I believe was called Title I at the time. And these kiddos, literally, their reprieve there was coming to school, right? Some of them were not eating uh, breakfast or or certainly even dinners. And so when it that school was that moment to really be able to breathe and to have that and and it's just that's what I think about during these times or and I know there's so many programs that I've seen launch up in the various areas um, throughout well throughout the country where they are providing some of these meals but even like you said something as simple as wi-fi kiddos can't eat how are they going to have wi-fi and I know they've been doing chromebooks but I just man I that's what my mind goes to during these times is how are these kids when they don't have that moment? So I don't know if you you guys are seeing more of that as well, but it's just I I go back to watching my mom bringing snacks to these kids and giving them that break from where home wasn't necessarily the safest place. Right, that's so true. It's all about those those basic needs. And we've heard this before. You have to, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then there's Bloom's taxonomy, but you have to Maslow before you bloom, essentially. We have to get at those at those basic needs. And so many times, and a lot of the schools, they actually continue to have their meal service, um, as, at least in California, because, again, so many of those students depended on depended on those meals. So again, you're seeing the the difference in the needs, like where there's a Title I school where they have to focus on feeding the children, feeding their students. And then you have this, um, you know, the non-Title I schools, so the schools that are, you know, fully funded. And they um, they don't have to, they don't have to use their thought space to think about that. They can go straight into the instruction and straight into the enrichment. And so we're seeing that. And even if we have students that um, that have that qualify for free and reduced lunch, even if we have the students in the higher income school districts, oftentimes they are forgotten because they're not a critical mass of their data. And their data looks good. Their assessments look good. So it, it really just is uh, not only an issue that only Title I schools have to figure out. It's just it's something that all the schools really have to look into as to are they truly, uh, you know, serving an equitable education and providing an equitable education and not just in a way that makes their data look good or, you know, they're only, you know, serving one set and not the other. And so some of these questions I urge educators to ask themselves are, okay, if you're in an honors class, how did you come up with that honors distinction? When did you decide that? Because many times a lot of uh, fifth grade teachers decide who's going to be in honors science and who's not. So mind you, these students are 10 and 11. And that, that decision is getting based on, you know, one teacher's recommendation. So what is the internal bias of that teacher? We, it's really difficult to say and tell. And that's why it's this like systemic need for us to do that reflection and that introspection. Like, am I, am I providing an, an equitable education? Yeah. And you've mentioned testing a couple of times. Clearly, it sounds like there's some real challenges with these testing, with the testing procedures, with not having biases towards a certain group of human beings. And how do you make it a level playing field? Do you see something in the near future or do you ha in the horizon that I can see these things changing from these tests to where, or, or is that literally part of the vision of STEM is to change that? I'm just curious because I know my kids, when they go to school, testing week, 
it, that's a big deal, right? No homework. And they're just, they're focused on those because I, I assume that helps their fun and it, it gives them better, uh, what is it? The great, the rating systems from a one to a 10 school in California. So do you see some of that changing in the near future? And can you talk to that coming from somebody that isn't in education, but I do have kids that go to school. I'm just curious, you know, what is that future with the testing requirements and what is the purpose if we're not really getting true data from it? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it all goes back to the system and how the system was created. So everyone wants a good school. Everyone wants that nice, you know, 10 great schools rating, because then that rating is going to affect the real estate market. So even realtors want a good school and they're like, oh, we want these test scores. And and so I have to say, if there's one positive that came out of the pandemic, it was the canceling of test scores. Because honestly, for me, as much as I see that, yes, there's an there's an accountability measure and um, that accountability measure is able to provide this data. The data is based on this arbitrary test made by um, companies making lots of money and and really they're. Again, it's that t- that week of testing, you know, where the students are like, okay, do well, and you get you get a nice party afterward. It it becomes this sort of a, a very arbitrary measure, and so we're actually seeing it translate to the call the higher education levels now with the elimination of the SAT and the ACT. And so there's a lot of mixed feelings where some are like, oh, but that that test is an indicator of, you know, of success. And um, and others are like, no, that test is racist or that test is a, um, an indicator of poverty more than achievement. And so we're seeing that when we have the, this emphasis on a test, so I can I can guarantee you that. Oh, the tests that my students take, I've had students that do well on the test that don't do well in the class and vice versa. So it's hard. So when we're making these very high stakes decisions based on that one test every year, that can be really detrimental to some of the education. And really speaking, it, it all goes down to how our schools are funded and they're funded by our property taxes. Well, obviously, not all property taxes are created equally. So you're going to have some schools that are funded really well, and you're going to have others that aren't. So as, you know, a parent to be, I'm not going to lie, knowing the system so well myself, I'm like, oh, well, I want to make sure that, uh, of course, my students go to a good school. But when we're saying that, we're actually saying, I want to make sure that my students are going to a fully funded school. And that's the reality that we have to accept is that, wait, so that means there are schools that aren't fully funded. And then you start asking more of those deeper questions. Yeah. So for one, congratulations, because I know you have a little bun in the oven and it's growing and I cannot wait to see this beautiful baby boy or girl. It's going to be absolutely amazing. But that is interesting that you're literally thinking about and and I did the same as a parent like okay what are the school ratings which means and I truly don't know what it meant I'm told that's a better school here versus there but it's uh, interesting so I want to get into the start of STEM and I really think it started with if I'm not mistaken there's something in the water the book that you had had come out with and I'd love for you to talk about that because it's pretty unique to to have this vision and take it and say, wait a minute, there's something even more than that. So can you can you tell us more about there's something in the water? Yeah, yeah. So when I was a, a county office administrator, I saw that, again, all the curriculum and all the instruction, all the materials, they're not very diverse. And the teams that create these materials are not very diverse. We don't even have a diverse teaching staff. And it's very difficult to hold on to our teachers of color and to maintain that diversity. So there is a huge issue in terms of one, lacking of role models for our students of color to kind of look up to and say, oh, wow, they look like me or they're in this book. I can be one, too. And number two, 
our white students have to grow up seeing people of color in these fields as well. It isn't just for our students of color. It, it has to be this sort of global message where everyone can be anything, just depending on what we highlight. So right now we have this horrible depiction of when we think of a Black man, we're seeing the images in the media, we're seeing the police brutality, we're seeing this like sort of negative, negative, negative. And our goal was to really dismantle that image and amplify a true positive image that our students can grow up to see. And, and that's how we ended up writing There's Something in the Water. Uh, by and and it's really based on the story of Dr. Tyrone Hayes, who is a world-renowned endocrinologist from UC Berkeley, and was also my uh, my professor when I was um, a student there. And and again, and as a place where I was able to get, I think, my first A in the class, which was very validating after failing introductory biology. So, um, but just to, one of the key things he said to me, or he said to the class, I felt like he was speaking to me. It was, um, you know, would we have a cure for sickle cell anemia if we had more African-American scientists and researchers? Or, or would we have a male birth control if we had more female researchers? I mean, and, and it made me wonder, like, I don't know, what, what, would that, what would that look like if we had just a little more, a lot more diversity in these in these arenas where so much so much decision making is happening and occurring so with that said i think um that's where i was like well we are young imagine our young black boys reading this story about dr tyrone hayes and seeing that it's, it's a real story we took his real story of his love for frogs and how he went on to harvard and then now as a professor at cal and, and we made it a, a kindergarten book based on the kindergarten uh, next generation science standards. So again, we're taking the standards and then we're combining it with this imagery of um, black culture and putting it together to, to really create this culturally responsive text that our young students can read. And, and the messaging was awesome. I mean, we just, we, we really just loved all the, um, all the feedback that we got. And that's when we had this sort of, we were at a crossroads where we were like, we have to do more than children's books. We have to be able to really scale this message in a way that, you know, the our teachers and our educators can really see the intersection of math and science standards and social justice and equity and really putting it together so that you're not doing one or the other, you're really doing this both in this sort of synchronous sort of way. And that's how we sort of created this vision. Oh, it's very cool. And I, I love the asking questions and just being curious. And, you know, I think, cause I can, I have to admit, I have many times that I'm just not a science person. I'm just not, I'm that guy. I'm a hundred percent like what, my degrees. Why did you do that? Because there was very little math and science. So it is, I love that. But it's interesting how much I love to ask questions. And it's, I mean, shoot, it's why I'm doing this podcast. So I would love for you to talk about fear to freedom is really the, the theme of this. And I'm sure your parents were fired up when you're like, look, I'm leaving my very well paid job, and I'm going to go start my own company, right? That, that was a seamless transition. Mom and dad are like, sweet. Oh my gosh. Uh, I think you highlighted this in your book. I had a very similar conversation. Uh, well, I, was, I, I remember that moment where I had hit a wall in terms of my career. I mean, I, I actually, I was at the height of my career um, and probably, probably going even higher. You know, it was just this, this perfect little, I've reached this stage and then I'm now, you know, on route to this. And, and, and I was just like on that pathway. But in terms of me hitting this mental wall where I was like, what are we doing? What are we doing? What's our goal? We've been doing the same thing in education for the last 30, 40 years. And we're not seeing any progress, at least for me. I mean, that's, I think, and, and I think that's a hard uh, conversation that we all as educators have to recognize. Like, 
what has changed since Brown versus Board of Education? We're still seeing our schools completely segregated, and we're also seeing a complete lack of diversity at our in our teaching populations, and we're not able to retain and recruit teachers of color to to be in the in the positions. So when we're having these systemic issues, it's hard to just get your promotion and then your next promotion and then your next promotion and get your salary and go home. I mean, again, I'm not going to lie. It was very nice and very comfortable, but that vision was lacking. And so, um, so that's something where I remember telling my parents, you know, I'm going to quit and I don't know what I'm going to do next, but it's going to be something that is aligned to my vision. And my parents were like, wait, so you're not injured. You're not, you're not getting fired. You, you can work, but you're just not going to because you don't like the vision. <laughs> so it was definitely interesting. And um, was it the most supported idea at the time? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's got to be hard as a parent. Again, hey, you got your undergrad at UC uh, Berkeley, then you got your doctorate at, uh, well, oh, USC. Yeah, yeah, you just go ahead and quit and just uh, go do something else because you're not fulfilled. It is a different generation. That idea is somewhat foreign, at least, you know, our folks are similar areas, range, or rage, age. <laughs> <laughs> age range they are very similar in that <laughs> regard but it is it's just an odd idea to them sometimes so it obviously took a lot of passion and it's one thing that i love about you you truly are passionate so i just have to ask you what inspires you to do all of this because i don't think you've ever had a bad day now i know that's not true because i know you personally but you always have this smile you're always inspired to just lift somebody else up where in the heck does that come from because i i want some more of it i love having lena in my life i need more of it but if people don't know you personally where do you get that from because i'm sure people want to have some more of it you know that's such a good I, it's a good question i need to ask myself when i'm like crying in the bathroom and my life is falling apart i'm like wait a minute i'm lena um and i think for me, it's all about just being able to see, again, stay committed to my vision. And and my vision was at least for um, even when I was working as an administrator, I was so passionate about what the teachers were doing. And I loved it. I loved my actual job. And I was like, how can I keep doing the work that I'm doing where I just love connecting with teachers and teaching teachers and coaching and being in that space. How can I do it? However, you know, do it on, on our terms, on our vision and, and something that we can really commit to without all this sort of, you know, I mean, of course there's going to be some, a little bit of bureaucracy, but you know, how do we really cut to the chase and commit to that? So I think for me, it's really all about, having a vision and and sticking with that vision. I mean, even in my personal life, I had this vision, you know, I'd see you and Lisa and I'm like, that's what I want. Like I need, that's, that's what I'm, I'm committed to. And that's what I want to see. And of course, years and years of, of dating and not really getting to that. Um, the only thing I had to do really was just rely on humor until that moment happened. And and that's the same thing. It's like, okay, I can cry about it or I can laugh about it. And and that's sort of what, what gets me going. And that's something that actually uh, occurred even at a very young age when, you know, there was like bullying and all this stuff that was happening. I was like, I, I don't know. I, I got to make myself laugh somehow because it's otherwise it's just, it, it, I'm just going to dig myself, dig deep into a hole. So that's kind of what I do. I try to look for the cheesiest dad joke that I can laugh at and <laughs> say, all right, there has to be another way. So it's humor. And then I think the other thing is just always going back to where there's a will, there's a way. And so if something doesn't happen, like we actually put in for a $5 million grant to um, sustain our business and and most likely we would have gotten it and and then a pandemic happened and they had to take the funds and reroute it back to the state 
So I'm not going to lie. I had my moment where I was crying in the pillows and, you know, behaving very CEO like. (laughs) (laughs) But then, you know, I found myself like surrounded by a team that said, let's figure out another way, you know, And, and that's when we all just shifted and said, let's build everything online. Let's commit to our vision and let's, um, go back to our, our framework and, and what we what we want to accomplish. So that's what we're on right now. We're on this mission to just continue to network with schools and districts. And the fact that we, you know, starting, we started, you know, we're about a year and a half years old as a business and we already have more than 20 partners. And so that I think speaks volumes. It's the fact that we've grown so fast and that uh, that's something that I the the other thing that I do. So the third thing I'd say, so humor, intention, and then the third thing I would say is just really understanding that um, you can do it, and and you always have to like stick to it. So it's funny because labeling, you even said it. You're like, I'm acting very CEO like. You know why I know you're gonna succeed. Because you are, and you are succeeding because you are such a, the human element is there. You truly do. You, you said it, you make a decision between laughter and cry. And it's a choice. Quite literally, it's a choice. And I'm not judging if you decide to cry, but you know what? You always get back up and you have that smile on your face. And I just, I, again, if people could see it right now, you've had a smile the entire time. It just makes the world a better place. So This is my favorite question to ask. So I just, I'm going to give it to you and let you go with it. What does the word freedom mean to you? I think for me, the best thing, and I, and I tend to be a storyteller. And, and so that's how I connect with people is that I listen to their stories and then I connect with my own. And so when I hear the word freedom, uh, uh, the most recent story that comes to mind is when I was in the doctor's office and my doctor asked, you know, have you arranged your maternity leave with your HR? And I was like, oh, well, um, I've, I've consulted with myself and I, I'm good. We, we know we have a plan for my maternity leave. And I left the office like, oh my gosh, wow. And, and I'm also in these, you know, these uh, maternity groups where I'm listening to everyone talk about how their boss won't let them take maternity leave or they are, um, they're, they're squabbling over when to do it and why and how and navigating all that. And, you know, just to be completely transparent, yes, we've had some ups and downs financially in the business and especially going from a very stable income to like, oh, we need to, you know, we need to grow. So there is that, you know, where I, I didn't have that. I, I will, you know, and, and we've been there before and we'll get there again. Um, but the the true cost of freedom is really priceless. Like being able to just have that conversation with my doctor so easily and have a whole thing in my thought space completely free of something I don't have to think about. I think it's really exciting. And, and when I see parents struggling with when to spend time with their kid and, and when to do what, it's really nice to know that, you know, Whoever comes out of me is going to have my attention because I feel like I've built a business that was meant for this moment. So I feel like that's what freedom is to me, is this idea that you can build something and you can also build something based on on your terms. And and so even with the with the whole vision, I had a vision for educational equity and I didn't see it in one arena. So I thought, well, why don't I build it and see if it's possible to do it in this arena where it's on my terms and, and, and we can come together and we can have this sort of vision. And that's, what's really kept our team going, especially when the finances are down and like, and now they're going right back up. So it's nice to be able to commit to that vision because it always takes us higher. Well, you have the grit. Um, it's going to be whatever boy or girl. I can't wait to be, or he will be beautiful. So you're going to be an amazing parent. Let me ask you this. What question 
should I have asked you? I didn't know enough to ask, and you're like, gosh darn it, JM, this is something I just have to share with the audience. Is there anything that I, I miss? Because I'm cool with it. I definitely miss things, and you have so much to offer. Is there something that you're like, gosh, I got to tell them this? You have been so comprehensive. I'm actually really like, wow, this is good. You know a lot about education. And I think what I love that you highlighted is the idea of, you know, what parents can do and how we can just be more um, cognizant of the systems around us. And uh, I know we touched upon a little bit, like, you know, with the property taxes and the funding and everything, but it's so much more than that. Um, A lot of the systems can be manipulated. Like you can have really good math and English scores, and that will take you to have these amazing, um, these amazing scores that you get. Um, But did your students have fun? Were they, were they engaged in the instruction? Were they excited to learn? You know, was was your teacher, was the teacher able to really ignite that curiosity and give your students the why behind their learning? And that's something that's really big that we sort of commit to when we're doing our teacher trainings is that we want that why to be present. I mean, even with business coaching, with everything, it's always about our why. And um, sometimes we wonder, are our students doing well because they're being compliant? Or are they doing well because they want they really want to do well? And so there's this like idea of like compliance, or we're gonna actually be these innovative and critical thinkers. So that's something that I would emphasize is that you know, learning is all around us, whether we're kids or adults and whether we're parents or whatnot. So how can we really make sure that we're doing that? And then also, um, since you do talk about this, this concept of freedom, a lot of times we get stuck in this whole cycle of, I need to do well, then I need to go to this college, and then I need to do this, and, and, and I, you hit all these benchmarks and check marks, right? And if you don't, you're labeled as a failure, or you didn't succeed. But one thing I wish I had learned when I was a student is, oh, I can start my own business? I can, I can create my own job. Like, wow, that, that never occurred to me. So, um, I, and and the fact that it can be possible, I think that's really exciting. It's this always coming back to this concept of freedom. I love it. You know, the, the idea of, because we never stop learning. I learn every single day how much I still need to learn. And that's the joy of learning. But I didn't get that in school necessarily. I did check off the boxes, some successfully, some not. But I'll tell you what, somewhere along the line, the idea that education never stops. And I hope listeners, I hope you get that. And if nothing else, get that to your kiddos, because there's so much in this beautiful world to learn. So let me ask you, Lena, how can people, how can our listeners connect with you online? Uh, join, find us on online. We are all over social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. We do Teacher Tuesdays and connect with our educating, with our educators. We hope to have you as well, JM. Um, so, and it's, it's all just about a conversation around education. So you can find us at STEM for Real, S-T-E-M number four, real, because we want to make it real and we want to make it exciting and real for our um, everyone. The, our Facebook group is open to educators and parents because really speaking, we're all educators and we're all in this fight for social justice. And that's our biggest mission. So you can do that. And we have our newest course that we are launching that's specifically geared towards our schools and districts. And it's called Leadership for Justice, because in order for us to really lead for justice, we, well, how do we name our course? That's what we're doing. We're leading for real for justice. And uh, we're really excited to see how this will translate to our schools, our leaders, and ultimately our students. Well, continue the great work. You make the world a better place, not only just person to person, but this idea that you have STEM for real, I think is amazing. I'm so proud of you and what you've accomplished. Thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Guys, 
Check us out next week as well. Lena was awesome. You guys continue to transcend in life. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us. That helps us build this community, and that is what we are all about. Building this community as big as we can, helping as many people as we can, and deliver as much value as possible. Be sure to head over to TranscendentLifePodcast.com for information on my coaching courses, and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Let's Go Win 365. Let's go win and transcend in life. This is the Transcend in Life Podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson, taking you from fear to freedom.